Hi, everybody. This is my first meeting night. Very excited to be here. Um, as soon as I get my... There we go. Okay. Um, so, like Tosca said, my name is James Maxley. Um, I'm the uh, Web Systems Director uh, director of Development at New Spring Church, which is um, a multi-campus church in South Carolina um, with a number of locations um, and some, I think, pretty cool online stuff that we're doing. Um, so, what I want to talk to you today about is Apollo. Um, kind of that's why we're here and what we're talking about. And what it's like to be a community contributor for that and really what the business value behind Apollo is um, and why as a church we're kind of looking into this as something that can really help us in the future. Um, so again, amazing Apollo site, check it out, it's pretty great. Um, this is the Apollo repo, or the organization on GitHub um, and I'm happy that my little photo is up there. Um, I feel like I've arrived. Um, and so there's a, a lot of really great projects already in this repo um, and they're all they're all open and they're all something that you can go and check out and kind of be part of. Um, you know, like the starter kit that Sashka just showed, the docs, which are really great and build off the same Meteor Guide template. That way we try and want to, every feature we ship, we want to make sure that as you're starting to use it, you can check it out and use it right now, which is really cool. Um, the kind of general idea of what we want to do, as well as React Apollo, which was one of the integrations that um, I built and actively maintain along with additions to the core client code. Um, and then there's New Spring Web. So this is kind of the, um, our organization, the team that I represent. And we have more repositories than we ever should, um, but we have a, a lot of ongoing projects. Um, and we have a lot of ongoing projects in a lot of different languages. Um, as an as a organization that has grown a lot over the past 15 years, um, like I imagine most of you or most um, consumers, you use a mixture of your own internal stuff, which you would of course love to have everything as internal, um, and exterior services, because you just can't build everything you want to. Um, and so we, you know, just like most, we manage that tension as well as we can, but there's certainly times where um, we'd love to have something internal. One of the things that we just launched um, along with this project that I'll be doing today is an internal management system called Rock. Um, and it was a project with um, a group called the Spark Developer Network, and it's an open source management system for people. Um, it's a way to kind of see what's going on and kind of take care of people as well as how to essentially run a church. Um, it has financial accounts, it has um, people data, check-in, kind of everything that you need to do to, to run a church. Um, it's a ASP.NET .NET app. So it's, um, it's written in .NET, it's a SQL backed, an MS SQL backed database. Um, and so as, as we know, a traditional Meteor app, we can't really use any of this data. Um, and so without Apollo and GraphQL, we, choosing Meteor means that we immediately lock ourselves out of all of our people data, which doesn't really allow us to you know, make sense as a business. Um, we also have our existing site, like our front end brochure site essentially, um, and this is a, a private repo because it's the only reason it's private is because we use a program called Expression Engine, which is a PHP application that's a content management system that we use to power our sites. Um, and so there's licensing agreement, that's why we keep it private. But that's MySQL. So as I kind of demo this app today, um, whenever I say MySQL, that's our front end sites. And whenever I say SQL, that's our, our people data. Um, and then we have our Meteor app, which is Mongo. So I want to kind of talk about what it looks like to merge Microsoft SQL, MS SQL, MySQL, Mongo, and a few REST clients, um, like for example, uh, the Google Site Search API. Um, so I'll start by first introducing to my boss, John Horton. Um, this is not his real photo. Um, and so this is inside Rock. So this is inside our, our church management system, and you can see on the le left side there we have our internal staff hub, our volunteer hub. So we have sort of a content management system inside of Rock. We also have um, our metrics, so attendance, so we have kind of raw data that we know if, if the church is being successful or not, or kind of where we need to focus. We have our, all of our people data, um, which is hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we've, when we moved to this service in March, we migrated a few million uh, rows of data, so it's a, it's a big app, um, as well as our financial data and then some um, associated tooling to work with the application. So again, this is, this is backed by SQL, by SQL Server. Um, and it's running on a, um, a VM, um, actually on a dedicated machine at our campus in Anderson, South Carolina right now. Um, we'd love to get to the cloud one day, but we'll get there. Um, this, if you're unfamiliar with Compose, Compose is a MongoDB hosting service, um, which I know a lot of media developers use. We love it because it's an easy way to get started on Mongo. Um, so this is, essentially, this is our media app. Um, and these are actually um, 
articles or pieces of content that my boss has liked in our upcoming native app that we're going to be launching next month. So as he's gone through and read an article, and he's like, yeah, this is really great. He's clicked a little heart button. Um, we don't have the cool Twitter animations yet, but hey, maybe we'll get there. Um, and he saved this to say, I want to look at this later. I want to show this to somebody, or I just really enjoyed this content. Um, and so you know, if you look into it, you're going to start to see, let me actually go back one. Um, for instance, let's see if I can find the right one here, albums. Um, OK, so this is, you can see Turn It Up. Actually, probably it's too small. Is that better? OK, so you can see. The title here is Turn It Up. Um, so what this is, is essentially it's a, it's a link from our user, which is the Meteor Count system in, Ro or in uh, Meteor, um, both back to our SQL application, so our person data, um, as well as forward to our content management system, um, which is where we have lots of, of content, because um, we've been doing this for 15 years now, and we have a lot of content creation that's happened. Um, and so although we're working to kind of migrate this, eventually right now we have just loads of data there. Um, so this is actually that Turn It Up album. So as you can see, Turn It Up, which is a music album for our kids' ministry. Um, and so with this, you have stuff like album images, you have the actual content, you have the list of tracks. Um, and this is all MySQL-backed. So we've seen SQL, MongoDB, and MySQL. Um, and so I kind of want to show you what it looks like to use GraphQL and use Apollo, which is built on GraphQL, to do stuff with this data um, and kind of how this is really what we think is going to change the way that we build applications. So I'm going to kind of try and live build out a query, but I've cheated a little bit and I've got mine kind of saved here. Um, but I'll still kind of walk you through it. So if we look at John, um, you can see in the URL at the end here, um, that's his, his ID. Um, so we'll use that for lookups because it's easier. Um, in production, we use an authentication service that's actually back through the media account system. Um, that way, private data is private. Um, and that's been a pretty cool integration to write. And actually, uh, Jonas, who's working on the Apollo client, shipped what will make it a lot easier, easier for us to take that client code and open source it as an easy way to use media account system with Apollo. Um, so hopefully, we'll have that out soon. So I've put in John's ID as a query variable down here. So you can imagine if this was in your app, you would pass this in as the logged in user's ID, and it's going to make the request. Um, so we'll, we'll build out this query here. I'm just going to kind of decompose these comments. We have the get person query, and you can see you, um, GraphQL is a statically typed system, which coming from the JavaScript world in the beginning, I was kind of frustrated by, because I like how easy JavaScript is to just say, like, hey, it's a string, it's a number, it's all true, maybe it's all false, we don't really know, but it's kind of fun that way. Um, but one of the cool things about GraphQL being typed is you're able to get some of the great developer tooling, um, like Sashko talked about, um, and you'll be able to get some of the great analytics, and really even eventually some really great UI tools as designers and developers um, to kind of just get access to all of your information. So we're going to get a person, which is um, a node defined on the schema. Um, so like we have a GraphQL backend that will migrate to Apollo server pretty soon. Um, and so we're just going to get John's first name and last name. So sure enough, Jonathan Horton. Um, so that's pulling live data um, right from here. You know, his full name is Jonathan, so that's what we're pulling. Um, and then, like, actually, if I were to add nickname, then this should be John. So now, with this query, we've been able to get SQL data, like that, um, which is really great. And in fact, um, believe it or not, this isn't even using a SQL adapter um, for all the queries. We have kind of a mixed world right now where some of this uses REST to call the client, and some of it uses SQL as we migrate stuff over. So um, you're probably not going to know when, but sometimes you're this is going to be a REST call, and sometimes it's going to be a database lookup. Um, and we actually built on top of this app, we have a Redis instance that caches all of this data as well. Um, so most of these requests actually go to Redis, and they never make it to an application. So from a sense of scaling, GraphQL can let you and Apollo can let you granularly scale your application as needed. So let's say that, like you, like us, have an internal machine. Um, you can set the TTLs and you can set your cache much more heavily on that because the availability may not be quite as high as you'd want it to, or it may be more expensive to scale out. Um, so that's really cool. Um, so let's say that we were making a UI component that was like a little profile card. Um, and so we want person's first name and last name. Um, and of course, we've got to have Colonel Sanders. Um, so we need a photo. So now we have his URL of his photo. Um, and then, because we're multi-campus and we don't really know where John is, we want to be able to get his campus. Um, so campus is, a, is another node, and it's another um, table in our SQL database. Um, and so you kind of, kind of think of this as a pivot join. So we can take his ID, uh, ID and we can grab what campus he has and then get some information about the campus. Um, and one of the interesting, interesting things is that in some instances, 
like you can kind of make circular dependencies where you can like traverse down the, your nodes and join almost to infinity. Um, I don't recommend it. But you know, location is another table in our system, and so um, this is it's not going to have any data here. But you can expand into a location object as well. So that's right now. This is all SQL, um, but it's really fast and it's, it's being pulled in. So I'm going to take campus back off. Um, as I showed earlier, the likes um, is actually in Mongo. So I'm just going to pull the ID. And the ID of this like is going to be that Mongo ID. Um, so I'm going to pull these. And you can see this is, this is actually the entry ID that's associated with that article or that piece of content in our MySQL database. But what you're seeing this ID field from is Mongo. Um, so this is now SQL and Mongo data joined together through the Meteor Count system, which is really awesome. Um, and it's, it's hooked into our like rock account system, um, and so we're kind of bridging that gap. But the ID doesn't really do me any good. I can't show a cool card of the most recent thing that John liked based off the ID. I can probably show counts, but that's not really all that helpful. Um, so let's say that I wanted to show the title. Um, so again, one of the cool things here is that GraphQL has autocomplete with this app, but you can also kind of assign on the fly what your names are going to be, which as a front-end developer means that however the back-end was designed isn't going to restrict me on how I want to use the front-end. Um, which is really incredible for. So let's say that to be semantic, um, I wanted to call this the card title. Um, and you can see this started to be the red underline because card title doesn't exist, but GraphQL will let you map an existing field to that name. So when I build my components as a UI designer, I need to know contextually what this data is for instead of like everything being this abstracted name. Um, so I'm going to remove, actually I'll keep both of them right there. So you can see it's going to pull both those fields. And one of the reasons why it can pull both those fields is because we don't have any arguments, but you can actually use different arguments on the same field. So say if you had a photo and you wanted a, a big image, like a um, 500 by 500, and a small image of 200 by 200, you could make those at the same time on the same request. Um, so there's no extra processing that goes on. You don't have to make subsequent requests. You can do it all at once. So I'm going to remove um, the card title up here. So cool, now I've got some car titles. And you notice one of the second likes that we saw in the database is, is turn it up. Um, but something like waiting is the hardest part is an article. Um, so we have different content types. But GraphQL will let you go through and kind of map all those together. Um, so I'm going to uncomment all this query together. And what we're looking at now, because you saw in our Compose database, we already had title and we had entry ID, which we are mapping to ID. So I could be lying to you, and this could all just be Mongo data right now. Um, but as you can see, none of this information is here. Um, so we're going to we're going to move beyond the Mongo world now. Um, so we've gone from SQL to Mongo, and now we're going to go to MySQL. So when I hit this query, hopefully, sure enough, I have data. Um, so if I looked at um, Turn It Up, which is this one right here, you can see down here the title, Turn It Up, um, and this has all of the tracks here. So it has the file, so we can add them to an app, and you can stream them. Um, we have description, we have images, so we can show a nice UI, and that's all controlled in the MySQL database right now. Um, so with this one query, and I'll kind of zoom out a little bit, um, that really is, I mean, it's, it's 26 lines of code with a query wrapper. I've gone through three different databases. Um, I've pivoted through those databases on based off of IDs. Um, I have this data cached in Redis, so it's near instant, um, and I can make these requests from as many clients as I want to. So I'm not even limited by the scale of my Meteor app, um, because it's all the clients that are doing the heavy requesting work. Um, and I can scale my GraphQL service kind of infinitely, um, which is really cool. So that's kind of how data comes. Now, this is really great, and we're all developers, so we really like to see this. But at the end of the day, we're talking about business value here. How does this help me to make an app better, faster, to help my end users? Um, so one of the apps that we launched along our new um, internal platform was an external way to give. Um, we're, we're church, so we handle all of our income through donations. Um, and so this is our giving platform. Um, and with it is a way to have your accounts. So I'm actually signed in right now. Um, I have a saved credit card. Um, and this allows you to go through and give. What you're looking at right now are those three databases. Um, so this big guy in the brain suit um, is stored in our content management system, because he's a, a nice big image. All of these campaigns are a mixture of data. So the content that you see um, is in our content management system, but the financial account that they represent is in our internal system, because it ties in with our financial system. 
Um, and then me being logged in means that I have Mongo data as well because I have my user account um, and I'm like successfully authenticated. Um, so when you load this page, when you load any page pretty much on our new platform and every app that we build from here on out, you're going to be getting data from at least three resources. Um, what's really cool is that Apollo um, and GraphQL play really well with REST endpoints too. So we have this search app and um, or the search part of our site and we'd love if you could uh, or if we could one day build an Elasticsearch, but we haven't gotten there yet. So we use Google Site Search behind the scenes. Um, and so this query is going to go directly to Google Site Search, um, and it's going to return it back. So if I search for Anderson um, as like the campus, then it's going to make that query, and then this is all data pulled from Google Site Search. So I just hit Google as a REST endpoint. Um, we don't cache any of Google's because that's in the license agreement we make with them. But you can still see how quickly it is. Google, of course, has near instantaneous response, and so the bottleneck's always going to be on us. But GraphQL in itself is, is very, very fast. Um, and so this is kind of, this is in production. Um, we've had it in production since March 9th. We've taken in um, you know, a significant amount of money. We've had a really good response from it. Um, and even the response time itself is, is pretty good. So I'm going to be brave here, and I'm going to refresh the page, and hopefully nothing goes down. Um, so right now, we're coming in and averaging around a 600 to 750 millisecond first load. Um, and for a Meteor app, normally that first load, as you're aware, is a spinner. Um, but if you, if you look at ours, there's no spinner. What you get is kind of um, dummy content, and then you can see, or not dummy content, you get real content. And then you can kind of watch and watch the, the review using. Um, so we kind of will come in, and we know that I'm logged in, and then later on the client side, we'll fetch my saved account. Um, and so what's really cool about Apollo, and one of the features that we just shipped, is um, hydrating of the store, which is a really weird thing to say. Um, but essentially what it means is you're taking the data that you've already fetched on the server, um, and you're sending it to the client. That way when the client app, the JavaScript actually loads up an instruments, it doesn't need to make any more requests, because the server already had it. Um, and so we actually statically cache the rendered markup of our Meteor app. Um, and we use, like, uh, we use varnish caching in some areas, and some areas we don't. So, uh, John Pinkerton, a developer on my team, actually wrote a Meteor package um, that integrates with React Router that allows you to um, like set a static cache on your rendered markup. Um, and if you look at all of this wonderful stuff down here, this big just base64 encoded object, um, that's all of our GraphQL data, um, as well as some other like client-side settings. And so the first thing that the app does, you can see all the content here, is it's going to read this object, um, and it's going to say, oh, I got everything. I don't need to make any other queries except for what I'm missing, which is, in, in this case, this. Um, so that's kind of how we're using um, GraphQL and soon to be Apollo. Um, part of this project is running a little bit on Apollo. Our native app that we're going to be rolling out next month right now has been entirely moved to Apollo. So the Apollo client is you know, kind of production ready depending on the, the scale of what you need to use. Um, but we also really encourage contributions. Um, it's been great. I know Tom talked about being a community like member and a contributor. This is, this is how we've been able to do that is because Meteor has accepted us to start to be able to do this. Um, and in fact, I have an open PR right now on the Apollo client to add polling, um, which is kind of like the first step towards reactivity. So all in all, we're, we're really excited about the future of Apollo. Um, it's already made business sense for us, and I think that's going to make a lot of business sense for you guys. So thank you. No, so we, um, we kind of wrote a pre-Apollo um, before we kind of got connected with Meteor. So Facebook's open source GraphQL, and we use, we've already used Redux behind the scenes on our app. So what we built was essentially a very bad version of Apollo um, that powers that site right now. And it, it's, you know, it's kind of glued together, um, but that's part of shipping. And so like what, uh, what my team has been able to do is working with um, Sashko and the Meteor group as we've been adding to Apollo, is we've been migrating our stuff over to be using Apollo. Um, so it's all open source technology, and so we just kind of were a little bit early in the game. Yeah, and uh, one of the things we're doing is essentially intentionally shipping everything before it's ready uh, so that we can give people a way to have an input super early in the development process so we don't get to somewhere where we have something that's polished, but it's the wrong thing. Yeah, so um, the question was, like, looking at these three databases, what does it look like to write the resolvers for it? Um, so <laughs> the question, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, 
once you write the initial bindings to like the database, um, a lot of times it's pretty easy because it's a single ID join. Um, and so writing the resolvers is taking one node or one field from like a parent node and getting um, the ID from that and using it to do a lookup on another one. Um, and so really it hasn't been, it hasn't really been all that bad, no. Um, it, one interesting thing about this, if you're like an active media developer um, on a team, is shipping uh, the back end and the front end kind of always happens together. Um, but with this split of Apollo server, our, high, our GraphQL server is running separately from our Meteor app. So we can kind of add new features to that before our client developers get to it. And so when they want to go live, they don't have to coordinate anything else. The data's just there waiting for them. Uh, yeah, and one thing I want to add is that's one of the places where we want to focus on in the future is uh, making it super easy to bind to common data sources, whether that's MongoDB or SQL, or maybe it's uh, something crazier like Salesforce or Dropbox so that you can uh, start pulling from things that aren't even databases. Yeah, so the question is, you know, right now we have three databases. Um, do we have plans for expanding that now that it's no problem to connect? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, you know, we, we certainly don't want to have just every database because we can, um, although you know, we certainly could. Um, but we definitely believe that as developers, and you know this, we build things for certain reasons. Um, and so trying to, to shoehorn relational data into Mongo is, is not the best practice. Um, and so you know, there's these, this new exciting world of graph databases um, that we would love to get into to start building complex relational queries that um, even on a SQL server would have some issues with. Um, and so to be able to do that, and we can actually just write the resolver for Apollo and do it, means that we're kind of no longer limited by what our stack supports, because our stack now supports everything. So we can build what's best for our service. Uh, and we had one question from the YouTube stream, which was, uh, does Apollo uh, currently support Blaze, or will it support Blaze? Um, right now, we don't have a uh, first class integration with Tracker uh, or Blaze. The, integra the integrations we have are uh, with observables, which work great with Angular. And uh, we have a React container that works uh, really well with Redux. Um, but if people have a desire to have that kind of integration earlier rather than later, please file an issue on GitHub and we can talk about the best way to get that done. Uh, maybe one more question? No? Great. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.